Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast. This is Thought Leaders with Joe Craig. My guest today is General George Jalwin, author of Watchmen at the Gates, A Soldier's Journey from Berlin to Bosnia. General George Jalwin retired from the Army in 1997 as a four-star general. His career spanned 36 years and included roles in some of the highest leadership positions in the armed forces. General Jalwin also gained teaching experience at both the United States Military Academy and Loyola University. He lives in Arlington, Virginia. General Jalwin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Joe. I'm proud to be here. Great. So the book covers a long and storied career. I mean, you were there from when the Berlin Wall went up to when it came down and beyond. But I'd like to start the discussion with someone that you clearly loved and respected as an officer, and that's William DePew. You talk about the time when you were a second lieutenant, first assigned to the 3rd Infantry Division in Europe, and then Colonel DePew took you to walk the line. Can you tell us what happened, what were the lessons he taught you, and how did those lessons stay with you through your career? Well, I had been in Schweinfurt for less than 12 hours, and we got called to his office, all of us reporting in, and he went down the line, what did you want to do? There was one platoon open, and I said, I want that infantry platoon. It was in D Company. So he said, okay, we leave at 5.30 in the morning for a maneuver to Hohenfels, brief your platoon, and be ready to go. So that morning, we took off. I have now been in the command less than a day. And we got out to our defensive position, and about an hour later, here comes a helicopter, whoop, 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 and lands. I go out, and it's Colonel DePew. He said, I want to walk your line. And that lesson, that right on that day, was with me all the way to walking the line in Vietnam, to walking the line in Bosnia with the Russians. And when he walked the line with me, he got down to a machine gun position, plopped down in his starch fatigues, and said, let me see your range card. And the assistant gunner gave him the range card. He said, okay, you got eight empty yards of grazing fire. Start walking. Well, 50 yards out, he fell out of sight. And the two said, whose responsibility is this? And I said, mine. He said, right. And so we fixed it the next day, the next defensive position. He came in again. And this time he said, so let's go out about five or 600 meters. Your troops are on that hill mass behind us. And he said, you are now the Russian regimental commander. How are you going to attack that hill? And I said, well, I'm going to come in with massive artillery. And he said, that's exactly right. That's what he'll do. And what's your aim point? What are you going to adjust from? I said, there's a tree, a lone tree up there. And I said, we're going to adjust from that. He said, okay. So we started to walk the line when we got up on the ridge line. And we walked the line. I was feeling pretty good. Everybody was good. Who's on your left? Who's on your right? And we got to the machine gun. And he gave him his range card. And it was absolutely perfect. So I was feeling pretty good. And he said, look up. And I looked up, and it's a tree, the lone tree on that mountain that they were going to just fire from. So it was a lesson learned. So you mentioned with DePew, you know, focusing on the details, like who's on your left, who's on your right, can you trust them, checking range card and those kind of details. And that played a part when you had two separate deployments to Vietnam. First, as you mentioned, you were company commander, 26th regiment. A few years later, you went back as the operations officer for a battalion in 101st Airborne. How had things changed over the years since you got there for your second assignment? It was disturbing. And again, I got flown up there with the new brigade commander who said, you're going to be my three. And I got there and they said, no, no, you're going after this battalion. They've got some problems. I, I saluted, went out there, and instinctively, Joe, I said, I want to walk the line. So I walked the line, and it was dreadful. I mean, compared to the first tour, you know, there are a lot of great soldiers that were there on the second tour. I just have to tell it like it is. And the point of it is, when you walk the line, you learn a lot about the unit you're in. And there were rifles rusted shut. There was, you know, some reeking of marijuana. I went to the mortar platoon. They fell out, and there was a white squad and a black squad. And, you know, I'll, I'll live with that. So I gave them a fire mission, and they asked us over tea kettles. They had a very difficult time carrying out. And I said, you are the firepower for this battalion. You're the direct support, and you start training, get in the right uniform, and do your job, Lieutenant. But I'll be back here at 5 o'clock. Now, you know, I've been up all day, and I did go back at 5 o'clock. But even or not, they formed up. 
So they just need a little kick to get them going, and they did fairly well. And then a few weeks later, a month later, we're out at an adjacent fire base, Apollo, and all of a sudden I hear this return fire from a mortar platoon. It was my mortar platoon. <laughs> and they were so proud, and they were putting effective fire on that unit, the BC unit that was shooting at them. I looked over, and they gave me a new one. So touching moment. You know, but that's what leadership is all about, and that's the feedback you get when soldiers are proud of what they're doing and trained to do it right. Yeah, that message about focusing on morale and focusing on leadership, and, you know, not blaming the soldiers, but correcting the leaders to make sure that soldiers are properly trained and have a sense of urgency in their mission, it, it really comes through. Switch a little bit now and talk about your time teaching at Loyola University. I'm wondering how that informed your view of civil-military relations, and how did that influence your handling of political matters? I'm glad that you mentioned that, because that was a key learning point for me. I taught international relations, and it was very well received. The peaceful radicals now we had, they'd shut the university down when Kent State occurred. So they asked me to teach in a free university, and I was wedged in between Marxism and free love. So I showed up, and every dissident you could think of was in that coffee house. You got to reach out and not hide in a corner somewhere if you really believe in what our military stands for. You stand up and be counted on tough issues. But you listen to those that don't agree with you. You don't shut them up or walk out. You stay there, you listen to it, and that's what I did. Yeah, it was definitely inspiring to see that uh, there is actually a conversation among various groups with different viewpoints. Speaking of viewpoints, I want to talk about when you got the call from General John Vesey. He was about to be appointed chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and you wanted to stay with their division, but you saluted and went to Washington. How did that time with General Vesey affect your view of the Army's role in the joint fight? It was remarkable. I had learned from every one of them and every one of my commanders. And I hoped I was a commander that allowed my assistance and aid to participate in discussions and work that I did with the foreign leaders. Vesey was an ultimate teacher, and he just had a way of talking to not only soldiers, but other members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and presidents and senators and congressmen. And I really admired the guy and tried to serve him the best I could. Yeah, that's the fourth time I was asked to do something that yanked me out. My happy was the division commander was going to make me the ADC up at Schweinfurt, which I would covet. Mm -hmm. But I was in the war room with my happy and General Frozen going over the war plan. I was the chief of staff, and the aide came in and says, Colonel Jalvin, there's a phone call for you. I said, I'm in there with the division commander and a four-star general. Tell him I call him back. He said, it's General Vesey. Well, my happy and Crozen said, take the call. So I went down there and he said, I want you to be my XO. Mm -hmm. I said, General Vesey, I, I love it over here, what I'm doing. I'm sure there are people that you know, I've never worked for you, but you know that will make a better XO than I would. He says, just fly back. We'll talk back here and then make up your mind. So I flew back. They took me over to Fort McNair. He had a dinner. We sat there watching the boats on the canal. And he said, this is for two years but I really need you. We're going to do some important work, and I need you. And he, again, was a teacher, and I learned so much from him. Well, two years came up, and he said, the president asked me to stay. And I said, yes, sir, but I've been appointed to be the one star in Gerpingen in the 1st Infantry Division where I commanded a battalion. He said, I need you. So I saluted. Another time you had to salute and take a position is when you were serving as commander of 5th Corps. And you got the call to replace an ailing Max Thurman as commander of Southcom. During your time there, you helped the government of El Salvador make peace with the insurgent group FMLN. What lessons from that experience do you think could be applied to the counterinsurgency efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan? Absolutely. And I've tried to make that point. I hope someone reads this book and figures out that the same sort of thing with the Taliban, maybe it's a little different setting, but the same approach could be helpful there. By the way, when I went down to Panama, my first week to 10 days, there were three coups and insurrection and a war throughout the theater. And so I thought this is a sink stress test or something. <laughs> and when they got briefed, I said, what's our mission? And so they said, victory in El Salvador. 
I said, what does victory mean? So I went to the State Department, and I said, how do you see our mission in El Salvador? They said, we want to negotiate a settlement. Now, let me tell you, Joe, how important clarity is here. You've got one of my four conditions for success. Mm -hmm. Clarity of mission is important. So we flipped around and said, how do we bring both sides together? And that's easier said than done. But I put the heat on the FMLN to get them to the table to talk about how are we going to resolve all of this in a way that could bring peace and security to El Salvador. And so we did. We looked at, my words, confidence-building measures. So when the Army of El Salvador would take part of a very battalion, then the FMLN would take a battalion on their side. So they did that. Ponce was the general in charge of Minister of Defense, and he scaled back his battalion, and the FMLN didn't do anything. And I said, you're the military of a democratic country of El Salvador. You follow the script that we laid out for both sides. So he deactivated another battalion. And the press and the political heat was so great on the FMLN that they started to really stand down most of their forces. So another lesson learned. When you were a Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, the NATO force that was deployed to Bosnia to implement the Dayton Accords, which brought the end to hostilities, it was really historic for two reasons. One, it was the first time the alliance was ever stationed outside of uh, NATO territory. And secondly, and really interestingly me, is Russia contributed a brigade to the force. How in the world did that come to be? And were there any considerations well, of doing that in the future? Well, I would hope so. After every war, with the Germans, with the Japanese, we got pissed off for a while. Then we said, how do we bring them in? If these are important nations, we want to get them pulling on the rope with us. I think we should have done the same thing with the Russians. Now, they were a tough lot to deal with. General Glatrov was the airborne commander out of the Balkans that was going to land behind the Rhine River as the First Guard's tank army crashed through the full of the gap. And so he and I became, I won't say friends, but we respected one another. And so I told him that I would really appreciate a few. Now, they were working on sending an engineer platoon or something. I said, I want an infantry brigade. I said, I want troops and fighters that will send the right message to the warring factions in Bosnia. And so I drew a little sketch that talked about how we can train the common standards and procedures under a combined joint task force staff. But we'll have unity of command, and that's me. And we'll have robust rules of engagement, and we will have clarity in terms of the mission, and we'll have, hopefully, yet timely political guidance. Those are my conditions for success. He bought into it. Right. And he sent me uh, Airborne Infantry Brigade. And they were, Joe, I must say, they were very good. I'd like to wrap up our conversation using all the experiences you've had in your career to talk about what should the Army be doing working with NATO now as the U.S. pivots back toward near-peer competition? I think it's important to reach out. I know it's much tougher now because there's something with the Russians now are gearing us back to our Cold War. But I would find ways. I saw Reagan do it up in Iceland. I was up there when he met Gorbachev. There is a way. And when he said to Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall right in front of the wall, they now have a statue there for him. I mean, we have got to figure out how we can work. Uh, I found the Russians very strategic. And there was a dinner in England where all the ministers of defense came and also foreign secretaries. And I was sitting next to Mr. Krimakov. I believe he was the foreign minister at the time. I think he ended up being the leader of uh, Russia. But he and I were sitting together, and he said to me, why, General, do you have all this important thing to have NATO enlargement? It's going to put at risk our country, and it's going to put our nuclear forces at risk. And I said, Mr. Primakov, we don't have to be in Poland to put your atomic forces at risk. This is deterrence, and this is the free countries that we've liberated, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic. And I said, by the way, your threat is not from NATO. We're securing your western flank. Your threat is to the south and the Transcaucasus and China. And I said, that's where you should be focusing, and we want to work together. 
he said, how did American generals get so strategic or something like that? <laughs> right. But, you know, I just think you got to keep working the problem. Right. Well, it's important and hopeful strategic perspective for the future. General Jalman, I, I, I want to thank you for being our guest today and having this conversation. And I want to remind our listeners, his new book is called Watchmen at the Gates, A Soldier's Journey from Berlin to Bosnia. So again, thanks for being our guest, General Jalman. Thank you, Joe. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. The Army Matters podcast series is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission to educate, inform, and connect with the total Army, our industry partners, and our supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Have a great Army day. Hua.